I'm here with Andy Peng. Uh, so I posted the thing on Twitter saying like, if you wanted to book my time on Canly to talk about your work, uh, you could do it. And Andy was like one of the only ones to spontaneously uh, book my slot. And she has a great paper at ICML and we're going to talk about it. So yeah, Andy, welcome to the show. And yeah, what was your paper? Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, I was on Twitter and I saw a list of cool papers that Michael had made and my paper was on it and I was really excited about that. So here we are. Um, yeah, I, uh, we had a paper on how we can adapt uh, robotic policies in the face of distribution shift, and it involves, you know, having a little bit of human feedback to help diagnose and fix errors. Yeah, what's the like, um, like the main, the main intuition behind the paper? Like, how do you summarize for like people who don't really know about it? I, I will. Oh, okay. Tell. <laughs> gotcha. Sounds good. Um, yeah. So I think the main insight of the paper is. Um, at least the current way we kind of train deep learning policies for robots is, you know, we, we train a policy and then we deploy it into the world. And then if it fails in the world, we kind of like throw up our hands and say, oh, I guess like we should probably try retraining. Um, I guess our intuition in the paper was that this is a pretty inefficient process. And in fact, um, things the robot already knows can be leveraged towards adjusting its policy and adapting it um, for what the human actually wanted. And so we basically developed this human in a loop um, system where we have the robot generate a failure, um, provide what's called a counterfactual uh, explanation. So kind of like a what would have happened um, if something had changed in the policy. Um, and it helps give the human intuition as to why the policy failed. And then with that, kind of the human uh, can give feedback for fixing the policy in a way that's very efficient. Yeah, do you have like concrete examples for people on YouTube who like don't really understand what's like a policy and everything? Yeah, totally. So imagine you buy a robot in the factory, right? Um, you maybe order on Amazon and it comes to your house and you're like, okay, cool. Like I have this robot. I want it to help me pick up mugs. Um, I tell the robot, hey, can you please go and pick up my, um, my mug? And the robot unexpectedly crashes into your counter and you're like, why did this happen? Like, you know, like I, I don't know why the robot isn't behaving the way it's supposed to behave. And so uh, what we could do, uh, what we do end up uh, doing in our paper is we say, okay, Imagine that um, the robot already knew how to pick up um, glass mugs, but it didn't happen to know the very specific, um, let's just say, ceramic mug that you had in your house. Um, but it did know how to pick up glass mugs. So what the robot could do is provide a search um, in the space of things it already knows. So it looks through its knowledge and it says, okay, well, I don't know what you want, but I do know that if I can pick up uh, glass mugs, that's a thing that is uh, a, a thing that I can pick up. And so the, hu the robot then says, okay, um, I'm going to pick up, uh, you know, glass mugs or ceramic mugs and uh, show the human, like, is this something that you would have wanted or is this not something that you would have wanted? And then at this point, the human, human could have said, oh, okay, the fact that the mug was ceramic instead of glass is the reason why the policy was failing, right? Like, oh, I didn't seem to clarify that, like, oh, in this particular case, like, glass should not have impacted the robot's ability to pick up the object. And just, just to be clear, you have, like, a robot trying to reproduce what a human, like, does? So like picking up a glass yeah. and a, a mug, yeah. and um, and then you're trying to um, you know, see if the robot is doing everything correctly. And sometimes the robot like fails and crashes on the table, and it's like, and so you're trying to like to teach the robot somehow like how to behave like a like the human wanted at, at the start. So it's kind of like related to like aligning aligning like robots to like what humans want. Or that's right. Yeah, exactly. So we can think about it as humans have a particular um, internal motivation. They have an objective that only they know. And they don't exactly know how to communicate that to the robot. Meanwhile, the robot has a set of knowledge for basic actions. It knows how to do in a household, but it doesn't know what the human wants. And so we're trying to go through this interactive alignment process of generating um, what are desired actions that the robot should be producing. And, you know, I think Michael is exactly right, where the, the human demonstrates a desired behavior and the robot compares its current knowledge against that desired behavior and says, OK, like, I know how to produce this set of actions if a very specific thing, such as the mug texture being changed, um, were actually different in the scene. And so by isolating the very specific feature um, that the mug being ceramic was the problem and instead of being glass, um, it can kind of provide this like visual explanation space for communicating between the robot and the human that, oh, this is in fact the problem. And so we can think about it as interactive alignment of human and robot policies in the feature space. That's, that's like a great like uh, adjustment to the pitch for an alignment YouTube channel. That's right. Um, yeah. Did you, does it actually work? Like, did you test it on experiments? <laughs> yeah. So we tested this in a series of three simulated robotic domains. We started out in like a very easy kind of like grid world scenario um, where we wanted a, an agent to like navigate to particular points, pick up a key and then go through like a door. And then we also ended up testing this on a um, more realistic robotic simulator 
where we had a pick and place task on like a like a tabletop that we wanted us and robot arm to be able to pick up bowls or mugs or whatever and put them in different objects. And so I think we have some uh, future physical experiments planned. But for now, we uh, we're just working in, in simulated environments. So. When are they planning? When when you plan to release those physical things? Oh yeah, so we have some follow up uh, projects that we're really excited about that we're hoping to do on some uh, on some physical navigation robots for the fall. So for the fall, okay. yeah. Um, on you on your website, you mentioned that you're like especially in uh, interested in like having AIs behave ethically, mm -hmm. safely, and uh, equitably. Are you are you at all concerned about accessories from AI? Uh, yeah, I mean, of course. I think if you were to be working in the field at this moment in time and that were not a concern, I think I, I think it should be everyone's concern. And how much you weight that concern, I think, is a different question. But I think for me, yeah, I always came from a social policy background where I cared a lot about making sure that the systems we built were actually usable for end users. Like, I think it's cool that, like, machines can do all sorts of exciting things. But to me, they're not very useful unless, you know, the end user actually wants that behavior to come about. And so for me, a lot of what my research focuses on is thinking about how we can build systems that do what their actual users want. Is there like um, like any research direction you think is like particularly exciting to have like, um, you know, users to communicate to like agents or robots what they want to do? Like do you, you, you say on your like website that you want like robots to like learn continuously from human feedback. Is this... Are you bullish on like human feedback being the way to align robots? Yeah, that's actually a great question because I feel like nowadays RLHF for LLMs is like such a hot topic. But, you know, for those who come from the field of human robot interaction, um, it's actually a, a very old like tried and true method um, learning from binary preferences. Um, and actually, a lot of our work in the field focuses a lot on how different ways of human feedback can also be leveraged for teaching robots, not just binary preferences. And so I'm very excited by the fact that the rest of the machine learning community is, I guess, very excited about interactive feedback as a mechanism for moving forward. But I do think we've but scratched the tip of the iceberg on many, many other forms of creative, implicit human feedback we can also leverage. What are those like creative ways? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, uh, when you're working in something like language models, right, like binary preferences are, you're, you're a bit more constrained. But when you're working in body systems like robotics, things like gaze tracking, things like gesture pointing, things like... Um, like physical gestures and pushing of the robot. Like these are all different forms of feedback that, you know, when humans physically learn in the world, we can express. And so we should think about that in interactive systems, right? So, um, so, so you're saying we should like push our robots like our parents <laughs> push us? I'm saying that there are, that is but one way in which we can learn. Um, but even things like, you know, not just binary preferences, we can do labels on features. We can learn features in, you know, like physical spaces. Um, we can learn features in embodied spaces and transfer them into real spaces. You know, these are all kinds of things that are exciting to explore. So. So because we're in Hawaii and there's like a lot of papers here, um, do you have like any personal paper or like some stuff that you've seen recently that you think are, I think it's, like a, it's a difficult question or like more, more, more generally, like do you have like any like specific like area that you think people should like look into or? Yeah, I mean, obviously I think John Schulman's uh, tutorials on RLHF are exciting because I think it exposes the ML field to, you know, a, a particular set of problems that are very relevant today. Um, but other than that, I do think the kind of focus on interactive systems um, especially in the language model space, which is, you know, the current booming, I guess, subfield. Um, it, it's great because I think, you know, sequential decision making is applied to not just embodied systems, but also in terms of other systems that are, you know, temporally expressed like language tokens um, and how we think about interactively refining, um, you know, the, those those models for end deployed users, um, general alignment safety, like uh, that, that as appearing in, you know, fields that aren't just robotics are very exciting. And so I, I myself attend a lot of those talks at least, so. Do you, uh, this is going to be like more like a high level and like speculative question, but do you think um, we could get like a software takeoff from just like pure like LLM or like text interface? Or do you think we need some kind of like, like human level robotics uh, to get to like um, something dangerous? Oh, okay. That's a great question. I mean, I think nuclear codes can be pushed by just software systems, right? And so that is very scary for me. Whereas I think the traditional notion of like a Terminator coming through and like, you know, physically killing people is a very embodied type of thing. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that robotics, you know, actually translating actions from the simulated world into the physical world is kind of a last frontier of AGI just because, um, you know, like uh, reasoning as much as we think is like the very complex part of human decision making, we've actually found to be the most easily replicable 
uh, replicable. Whereas I think, you know, literally taking physical actions in high dimensional continuous spaces like the world is very, very challenging. Mm -hmm. um, and so like certainly many, you know, harms can be caused by non-embodied systems. But I think embodiment itself is a very difficult challenge that I think we're quite far from. So. Yeah, I was more thinking about like um, whether we could have something like self-improve and become like very smart yeah. purely in software. Or we would think like we need like have an, a robot like building new hardware or something or like printing something. But yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. I think this was great. Um, check out your work. Um, maybe say again your paper or how people can like reach you. Sure. Um, our paper is called Diagnosis Adaptation Feedback, a human in the loop uh, system for uh, robotic fine tuning. Um, and uh, we are at a poster session today at 1030. And otherwise, yeah, I guess I'll look at our website. <laughs> Probably won't be published in like an hour, but yeah. <laughs>